Thank you very much, Hannah. It's a great pleasure to chair this first session. And today's symposium really is about giving exposure to new research that's been generated not only by Henry Moore's work and career, but I think modern British sculpture uh, more broadly as well. And I think across the day we're going to hear some really exciting new perspectives and new ways in of thinking um, about this idea of becoming. And this first set of uh, papers that we have um, really thinks about the ideas of context, circumstance um, and connections um, of an artist's early career. And we're going to hear about Moore and Hepworth. Our two papers um, are given by uh, Robert Sutton and Rachel Smith. Both completed their PhDs at York in 2015. So fair to say early career uh, themselves. And I think that will be really interesting in thinking about these um, ideas. So um, I think I'm going to hand straight over to uh, Robert to give his paper um, on uh, educating Henry, contact, circumstance, educational opportunity. What we're going to do is Robert's going to give his paper and then we'll just take one or two questions um, and then Rachel will give her paper one or two questions and then we'll come together and have a, have a discussion as well. And we might eat into lunch and a little bit, but it's a generous and flexible programme uh, today. So I think it's worth giving time for us all um, to talk about these ideas uh, together. Uh, so, Rob, do you want to come up and give your paper? Thank you. <laughs> and then we'll just swap over. <laughs> Good morning. Um, so I'd like to start by thanking Sarah, John and Hannah for inviting me to speak today. I've been thinking about Henry's development, really, in various ways for this last seven years, so through my doctoral uh, research, and generally as a way to try and understand more about Henry the man. Um, I think this exhibition is a really important contribution to this discussion about trying to re-understand Henry from his origins through. So that's what I'm going to try and contribute today, um, some of the very early context of Moore's life, almost before the exhibition begins. So, in the introduction to his essay for the catalogue uh, on Moore's formative years, Sebastiano notes that there has long been a tendency to focus on Moore's early life from a purely biographical angle. The parables of Moore's various introductions to the methods and materials of sculpture have long been repeated as the means by which to suggest the near inevitability of his subsequent career. And yet, as the exhibition demonstrates, through the details of his earliest artistic experiments and experiences, what we are faced with is rather something of his gradual creative evolution. But there's also a broader history that needs to be traced to understand more, one intrinsically tied up with his personal biography, but at a remove, and that is the contextual history of Moore's development and the important role that circumstance and educational opportunity played in directing and making possible Moore's ascent. And Godfrey already alluded to this previously. I don't mean to sort of pull back, pull away from the idea of um, Moore having achieved what he did through his abilities, but I do want to really impress the importance of the context in which he came to be. I think it will appear in a second. So as is well known, Henry was um, here aged about 12, was born in Castleford in the West Riding, 1898. It's the penultimate year of the 19th century. And recent studies of the late Victorian and Edwardian eras, eras in Britain have tended to suggest that it was the turmoil and tumult of these years, rather than the Great War, which ushered in the 20th century. The rise of the organised labour movement, the extension of legislative reforms to confer upon women autonomous legal rights, that is, outside of or in lieu of marriage, and the implementation of state-maintained elementary education beginning in 1870, all served to facilitate the gradual democratisation of British society as increasing numbers of educational and professional opportunities became available for both women and for those classes of society previously disenfranchised. John Carey suggested that this introduction of universal elementary education was the most fundamental and significant factor impacting the lives of Britons at the fin de siècle, leading to significant advances in the literacy of the population. He writes, the difference between the 19th century mob and the 20th century mass is literacy. For the first time, a huge literate public had come into being, and consequently every aspect of the production and dissemination of the printed text became subject to revolution. 
However, Carey also suggests, and this is the focus of his uh, research and his work, that this shift in the cultural fabric of British life was a major factor in the development of modernist literature and art in the early 20th century, which he describes as a hostile re reaction to that unprecedentedly unprecedentedly loud reading public created by those reforms. He argues that the implicit purpose of modernist writing at its origin was to exclude these newly educated or semi-educated readers and so to preserve the intellectual seclusion from the mass. Implicit in Carey's reading of the segregation inherent in modernist literature is a cultural bias rooted in class formations. I think this is an important direction of thought which continues to present considerable questions for scholars exploring the development of modern visual art in Britain too. But more, by dint of his background and made evident in his work, punctured this suggestion. His belonging to that mass and his appreciation of it, I contend, directed his understanding of and his approach to his art. And once established as an artist, following the years explored in this exhibition, Moore spent much of his career concerned, at least in part, with pursuing an art available to and in complicated ways representative of that mass from which he emerged and to which I think he always belonged. As such, in a paper light on supporting images, I present you with these two images as support for my ideas at this stage. Photographs of Moore's family group of 1954 to 5, situated in Harlow, Newtown, and being enjoyed and appreciated fully by its intended audience. I believe these images effectively represent a version of Moore's work that also continues to demand further recognition and which forms the basis for my continued research on him. His having sculpted objects for the new public spaces of post-war Britain, they were both representative of and accountable to those new spaces and the people that populated them. Again, the 20th century mass. In a passionately articulated series of essays on the history of British educational policy and provision from the end of the 19th century through to, the public, through to its publication in 1942, Ernest Green, then General Secretary of the Workers' Educational Association, commented upon the consequential relationship between political reform and educational reform. As the franchise was extended, so too eventually was access to an affordable and ultimately a free education. The reform bills of 1832, 67, and 84 to 5 were followed, respectively, by the first state grant for education in 1833, the Forster Education Act of 1870, and the Balfour Morant Education Act of 1902. Later, the representation of the People's Act of 1918 and 28, the last of which extended the, extended the franchise equally for the first time to all men and women over the age of 21, were followed by the Fisher Education Act of 1918 and the bill to raise the school leaving age to 15, legislated for in 36. They weren't fulfilled until after the Second World War. Moore's educational and personal development would be directly shaped by the circumstances of those years, and his philosophy would be direct, defined in relation to it. In this paper, I'll present details of the development of educational provision in the United Kingdom with relation to Moore's experience of it, followed by a brief but hopefully purposeful history of the broader relationship with the expanded fields of education in the years that followed. Moore was the seventh of eight children born to Mary Baker and her husband, Raymond Spencer Moore, a coal miner in the small industrial town of Castleford. It was there that Moore received his formal education, first at the local elementary school and then at Castleford Secondary School, having received a county minor scholarship only at the third attempt. Before any of the anecdotes which pepper biographies and histories of Moore's early life, all of which are repeated as significant in that near-inevitable path to art school and to a career in the fine arts already discussed. I take this single detail as of fundamental importance in to the development of his career. Moore's attendance at secondary school was an opportunity which, in the early years of the last century, created other opportunities otherwise unavailable. State secondary education was only introduced with the Balfour Morant Education Act of 1902, which also established local <coughs> education authorities to take control of educational provision at a county level. This act made state elementary education universally free for the first time, just before Moore began school, and it empowered the new LEAs to build schools in line with requirement, as a result of which Castleford Secondary School was built between 1903 and 1908. The cost of secondary education continued to be prohibitive for most families, though a system of scholarships implemented to support a very few of the cleverest children offered some hope. The supplementary regulations for secondary schools in England, published in 1907, further supported the opening out of opportunity. 
stipulating that all state-funded schools must provide free school places for at least 25% of its pupils. At the third time of asking, Moore cemented his place among the top percentile of his cohort, following in the footsteps of his elder siblings by continuing his education. Joe Harris has referred to this period as one in which the tentacles of class became all-embracing, writing, quite apart from the stratifying impact of property distribution and large-scale machine production, between 1870 and 1914, the organization of work, schools, housing, welfare, culture, and recreation all conspired to compartmentalize British society on class lines. And yet it was also the reformed shape and nature of educational opportunity and provision, Harris argues, that made those lines negotiable, with the county council grammar schools among a selection of educational institutions, the emergence and the impact of which began a slow process, not of dismantling the class system, but of loosening its bonds for selected individuals, and most readily so in the frontier between the upper working class and the lower middle class. That Moore and three of his siblings went on to become school teachers is a mark of the navig navigability of that gap and the importance of education facilitate, facilitating that transition, but also of his, of his family's desire to transgress it. Moore's training as a school teacher was the di direct result of his father's advice upon learning of Moore's desire to attend art school, as written by Herbert Reed. You ought to do what your brother has done. Get yourself qualified to earn a living, and after that, if you still want to become a sculptor, all right, but first get qualified. And, those more, and though Moore's experience as a school teacher was only fleeting, in the early years of the war before his 18th birthday, and once again after the war, he would spend the first two decades of his artistic career in art schools before a life spent working with, teaching, and learning from the numerous assistants that passed through the workshop here at Perry Green. This fact is, I contend, central to an understanding of the artist and the man. Moore's father, though he left school at the age of nine to work on the land, was, in the word of Moore's biographer, John Russell, a thoughtful and tenacious individual who would have gone quickly to the top if he had the chance of a formal education. Raymond Moore's hope was that his children would succeed where he had not, by way of the opportunities then available. This desire was mirrored by one for his own self-improvement, pushing himself through the examinations required for promotion within the coal mine, first a deputy and then under manager. Moore's father also taught himself the violin and enough of the basics of geometry and algebra required in order to help Henry and his siblings with their homework. The shape of Moore's father's desire for his own self-improvement and of his hopes for his children seemed likely to have been encouraged and supported by his membership of the Yorkshire Miners Association, of which his friend Herbert Smith was the first president. Moore would recall that meetings in their living room might have been among the earliest of the YMA, and Raymond's political and professional allegiances no doubt introduced him to the thoughts of reformers such as John Ruskin, who he in turn introduced to Henry, an influence Peter Fuller has suggested had a significant impact on the development of Moore's attitudes. Certainly, Raymond Moore's involvement in the Miners Association would have brought him close to the centre of discussions, which led to the 68-week strike over wage levels maintained by miners at the Welldale Colliery, where he worked, between 1902 and 1904, and would similarly have impacted upon the formulation of his son's politics. But throughout this period, Moore's mother and five, father, likely struggling financially, continued to insist upon the importance of their children's education is testament to the strength of their belief. Moore's encounters with the wider cultural world both geographically and conceptually, began with his education. And his father's conception of self-improvement, like his politics, would have encouraged Moore to see beyond the perimeters of Castleford. But in order to draw out the ways in which Moore was able to develop an aesthetic appreciation located within that broader cultural world, it is important to conceive of the way art education was conceptualized and delivered in the years prior to and during his schooling. So Michael Sadler, who Moore would meet after the war when he began studying at the Leeds School of Art, was one of the most significant educationalists of his day and one of the most respected. Before taking on the vice chancellorship of Leeds University, Sadler worked for a brief time on the Board of Education for whom he had completed a series of studies on educational provision in different parts of England. His report on Huddersfield, and particularly the chapter on the teaching of art in Huddersfield and its bearing upon the trade of the borough, if not directly applicable to Castleford, is certainly useful in considering an aspect of educational thought regarding the industrial towns of the West Riding. Of the importance of the study of art and design in towns with strong textile industries, as was the case in Castleford, Sadler writes, it has been found profitable in great manufacturing centres to make a systematic effort for the improvement of art teaching in all the schools attended by children, 
and young people of the community. It is not enough to have a school of art devoted to instruction in drawing and design. The art teaching in all the schools should be correlated as to, one, to produce a greater sensitiveness to artistic beauty throughout the masses of the population. Two, to stimulate in individual children latent artistic gifts, which may lie undeveloped in the most unexpected quarters, to bring under the notice of the ch teacher's children possessing such gifts, and to secure for them a progressive course of art teaching appropriate for their talent. And three, to lead up with the least waste of effort to the higher teaching at the School of Art, and to prevent the young people from being taught in their early years methods of work which would subsequently have to unlearn. And though these suggestions were still more ideological than pragmatic, they reveal something of an attitude towards the significance of art among educationalists, rehearsing and revising the connections between design and industry advanced by the likes of Ruskin and William Morris. More pertinent to this discussion, however, are the ways in which Sadler's suggestions relate directly to aspects of Moore's own experience of art, as they have been written up to now, and the ways in which his ostensible natural talent was nurtured. If Sadler's suggestions were not taken on wholesale, that is not to say that the broader belief in the place of art and aesthetics in education was not taken on it intermittently, and more certainly profited from a non-typical experience of art education whilst in Castleford. In the various biographies of Moore, his introduction to art is most often recounted, recounted, recounted as being the result of one particular teacher, Miss Alice Gostick, shown here on the left, with Henry at her feet. A woman of half French origin who was the first to recognize the exceptional nature of her pupils' talents and consistently encouraged their development throughout the decisive years of his education. It was Gostick's collection of journals and books and her readiness to lend them to her pupils that introduced Moore to both old masters and the continental avant-garde's in the early 20th century. More significant for the development of Moore's career, however, might be the suggestion by Herbert Reed that it was Gostick who draw, drew Moore and his friend's attention to the availability of ex-servicemen's grants to get to art school after the war, whilst also supposedly drawing, attention, drawing the attention of the chief art inspector of the West Riding to her impressive pupils. Another figure at Castleford Secondary School who is consistently rendered significant is the headmaster, Toddy, Do Toddy Dawes, an unorthodox, remarkable, and, excite and exciting man, whose influence on the sculptor has been limited in biographies to the fortune and happenstance of more having been to his school, with Dawes' propensity for cultural school outings suggested to have had particular influence on his students, not least more. Of more immediate relevance to young Moore's burgeoning artistic procl proclivities was Dawes' interest in English church architecture, wrote Moore's biographer, Roger Bertou, mentioning St. Oswald's Church at Methley explicitly. Although he may have been familiar from family visits to the church in which his parents had married, it was no doubt Dawes who drew his attention to its finer details. And Penelope Curtis and Fiona Russell have suggested the importance of um, the monument to Lionel, Lord Wells and his wife from St. Oswald's, on the conception of Moore's Madonna and Child, on the right here. But any further elaboration on Dawes' significance has been otherwise absent from histories of Moore's career, save for one review of a book on Moore written by another former Castleford pupil, the author J. L. Carr. Carr writes, in 1907, this exciting man came from Carmarthen to be the secondary school's first headmaster. He immediately demanded extras, a library, a grand piano, and a proper art studio. Then, for the succeeding quarter of a century, he encouraged a mildly anarchic society for the preservation and extension of individuality. For the most part, Carr's review ignores the book at which it is, it is ostensibly, ostensibly aimed, a point Carr's biographer took to be a slight on Moore. Instead, Carr, 12, 12 years Moore's junior, used the space of the book review to praise Dawes' impact on their school. This small detail of cultural history and its method of delivery confirm the difference between the mythologies that surround Moore, often perpetrated and indeed perpetuated by Moore himself, and the alternative histories that might be offered by those wishing to look beyond the mythology. In the promotion of Dawes, Carr was merely honoring the circumstances of Moore's origins as he understood them. He finished the review. It may be a sign of the times that this extraordinary man, Dawes, passionately urging resistance to believe only what one is taught to believe, repeating what one has been told to say, doing what we expected to do, living like clockwork dolls, should be unrecognized, half forgotten and unmentioned. And so I'm happy to be able again to invoke his apparent impact on Moore at this time 
as we reappraise Moore's beginnings. Of course, Dawes' absence from histories might just as easily relate to a lack of archival information concerning his impact on Moore, or the simple matter of Alice Gostick having Moore obviously had a direct impact on Moore's development and having maintained contact with him. Another often repeated story from Moore's development, already mentioned this morning, is that the Sunday school teacher who introduced the young and impressionable Henry to sculpture via, via a parable about Michelangelo. The tale is told repeatedly, and the suggestion is always, and Moore repeats this, that suddenly Moore knew he wanted to be a sculptor. But of equal importance seems to be the implicit equation of Moore with Michelangelo, as though at this young stage the baton was being handed down. Similarly, stories of Moore's whittling small objects from wood for use in childhood games, casting objects in modelling clay taken from the neighbouring potteries, or visiting a local rocky outcrop known as the Adel Rock, are all omnipresent in biographies of Moore, rendered as momentous moments in the development of the artist's plastic sensibilities. These are the sorts of stories preferred by biographies, biographers with a tale to tell, and historians caught up in the amenability of narrative prose. They all share the same desire to excavate these early signs of Moore's artistic prowess in order to reveal a natural, as opposed to learnt, propensity for sculptural form. But the facts of Moore's education, his having had a series of interesting and interested teachers, and the opportunity to learn in an environment that promised more than its immediate surroundings could offer, less than a decade after secondary education was made potentially available to the children from such a community, appear to me the ones worth commenting upon. As the first two years of the Great War were played out, Moore studied for and received the Cambridge Senior Certificate required in order to enter teacher training college, briefly returning to his elementary school as a student teacher before enlisting, enlisting for the army in 1916 after his 18th birthday. It need hardly be ignored that when Moore two years older, he might have been heading to war sooner, where he might have suffered the same fate as his sculptural forebear, Henri gaudier Breschka. But what's certain is that his having trained as a school teacher got him out of service sooner. Teachers were some of the first groups to be demobilized after the armistice, and Moore wasted no time in applying for that ex-serviceman's grant to support his application to the Leeds School of Art. It was in Leeds that Moore's entrance into the modern world of art began via the collection of Sir Michael Sadler and via the writings of Roger Fry. Again, the circumstance of Moore's schooling brought him into the orbit of figures whose influence on him was surely more than just anecdotal. On the significance of Moore's access to Sadler's collection as a student, Herbert Reed wrote, Sadler had a collection of paintings and sculpture which was quite exceptional for its time. It included not only Constable, Turner and other English masters, but also African Negro sculpture and works by Gauguin, Cezanne, Rouault, Matisse, de Quirico and Kandinsky. The list reads like a rundown of the points of precedence that would anchor more subsequent development. Here we have the British tradition, primitive art and early continental modernism thrown together as though part of a logical continuum in the history of art, paving the way for Moore's earliest experiments in form. I'm showing just a few works that Sadler would have owned about this time. Um, got Gauguin, Gaudier Breschka, Kandinsky, and um, Bonner. And if Sadler's collection provided the visual stimulus, Fry's writings provided the textual grounding for Moore's burgeoning interest in the extra-European. 20 years later, in an essay for the listener on primitive art, Moore was still rehearsing and reconfiguring Fry's ideas, even as he turned away from the form lessons of the British Museum in his work. But as Alan, as Alan Wilkinson noted in the introduction to his survey of Moore's drawings, the facts of his classroom-bound art training, the true beginning, were much more traditional. Though none of Moore's drawings from his time at Leeds survive, Wilkinson suggests that the results would have likely been nondescript, telling us less about the works he saw in Sadler's office and found in books and more about the atmosphere in English provincial art school. Moore himself recalled that art schools then, and especially in the provinces, had a terribly closed academic outlook, where any excitement that students might have had about the pursuit of an art education were deadened and killed off by humdrum copying from the antique, just making very careful stump-shaded drawings with no understanding whatever of form. And I look forward to uh, Alex's further discussion of just this context later this afternoon. However, in an interview with the art historian Vera and John Russell for the Sunday Times, Moore recalled his first experience of Leeds more pragmatically. My first few months at college had rid me of the romantic idea that art schools were of no value, and I'd begun to draw from life as hard as I could. A sculptor needs to be able to see and understand three-dimensional forms strongly, and you can only do that with a great deal of experience and struggle. 
It's not only a matter of training. You can't understand it without being emotionally involved. And so it isn't just academic training. It really is a deep, strong, fundamental struggle to understand oneself as much as to understand what one's drawing. To understand the beginning of Moore's education as fueled by this sort of close engagement with the academic ideal, alongside which he versed himself in the form lessons and rhetoric of modernism, goes some way toward engaging with Moore's subsequent artistic approach and the ways in which he sought to understand himself and to present that outwardly in form. In the same interview, Moore would also declare, I'm ter terribly grateful that I didn't get to Leeds till I was old enough not to believe what I was told by teachers. The independence of his thought, even at such an early age of his schooling, an early stage of his schooling, was surely central to his ability and propensity to bend the rules. It was this that led him to, to develop upon that which he was discovering in books, away from the trappings of the classroom. Writing about the early bushy sketchbook of 1920, some pages of which I'm showing here, Krista Lichtenstern located the breadth of Moore's interests apparent at this early stage. She writes, on 39 written pages and in 26 drawings, Moore had his selection of Chaldean, Babylonian, Assyrian, Greek, and Roman sculpture, and worked over the artistic ideas of Michelangelo, his long-standing model. He also attempted to acquire an overall view of Greek, Roman, Byzantine, as well as Gothic and Renaissance architectural forms. Thus it was remarkable, with remarkable care, that the 22-year-old assimilated a basic art historical knowledge, which significantly extended beyond the traditional curriculum of classical and Hellenistic antiquities. Again, this range of influence is effectively demonstrated in the exhibition we'll see today. It was not until the second year of Moore's studies at, studies at Leeds that he decided to concentrate on sculpture, as a result of which a department was set up in which Moore was to be the only student. Moore's tutor, R.T. Cotterell, had recently qualified from the Royal College, and though little of Cotterell's influence on Moore has been written, partly because Moore considered that he wasn't a very good sculptor, the facts of Cotterell's appreciation of the Royal College's expectations together with his undivided attention, would certainly have contributed to Moore's su successful application for a Royal Exhibition Scholarship just one year of a um, after just one year of a two-year examination course. As Moore wrote it, he could concentrate entirely on teaching me all the tricks he knew. And so again, fortune and circumstance come to the fore. Moore's move to London would be the setting for his true discovery of extra-European sculpture at the British Museum, supported by the collections of the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the contents of Zwemmer's bookshop, after which point more story is better told by others and by the exhibition than I've got the time to here. But it is worth noting, finally, that in his history of social radicalism in the arts, Donald Drew Egbert remarked upon the Royal College's role in catering to, quote, quote, students who would have to earn a living from their art and who therefore were much more likely to become socially and politically concerned. And that's in distinction from the Slade, which catered primarily for well-to-do families in the early part of the century. A further significance, again already mentioned, was the Royal College's having recently appointed Sir William Rothenstein as principal, uh, which Moore described as follows. The college was pretty much in the doldrums. It had become a place to train teachers, to train teachers, to train teachers, and so on, something eating its own tail. Rothenstein, who believed that, art, that teaching art should not be a career in itself, shook up the college in many ways and gradually changed many of the old staff. He brought this air of a wider, more international outlook into the college. There is no doubt that I gained much through Rothenstein being principal of the college. Indeed, after Moore's graduation, it would be Rothenstein that offered him his first part-time job as an instructor um, after the previous professor had resigned his post. The contract was for two days a week and paid £240 per annum for just 66 days' work a year, which supported his work throughout the rest of the 20s. And after the Royal College, Moore's next teaching position at the Chelsea School of Art, lasting from 1931 to 1939, would pay between 178 and 225 pounds per year for similarly few days' work, affording more the opportunity to work on sculpture and to buy materials ahead of future sales. And so, again, it was Moore's educational opportunities, all stemming from a fundamental appreciation for and investment in the importance of both teaching and learning, that directed and made possible the development of his career. Writing in his biography of Moore from 1965, Herbert Reed wrote, Henry Moore's education may be divided into three stages, elementary, secondary, and professional. But these words indicate formal categories that tell us nothing about the actual process, which has little to do with categories or curricula, but was rather the direct influence of the places and people with whom the boy and then the youth came into accidental contact. 
A sculptor, like a poet, is born, not made. And I have always given a few indications of the presence in Moore of an innate plastic sensibility which education might foster, but could not create. As I've suggested already, I find this sort of mythologization troubling and unhelpful. And Reed is one of the worst perpetrators of this version of Moore. I believe this exhibition we're here to see today provides an excellent opportunity to explore just how the sculpture was made through his formative experiences. And I hope to have added some useful context to appreciate how any innate sensibilities that Moore might have harbored were let free as a result of circumstance, led by political and educational reform at the beginning of the century. And I'm glad to have been able to point, if only briefly, to something of Moore's recognition of those facts too. Thank you. to a lively start and really, I think, shaking things up methodologically, asking actually how do you take um, a biography and the, the facts and the circumstances of an artist's life and think about them within this, as I understood it, this infrastructure mm -hmm. of education. And it's sort of doing two kinds of history in a way, isn't it? Sort of taking the, the biographical mm -hmm. and really thinking about in a those social formations and, and mm -hmm. infrastructures which shape our lives on a political and Absolutely. on a social level. So I think that's you're asking us to think in methodologically actually mm. about how to do this kind of work, how to do this research which goes on beyond a kind of cultural biography. Yeah, so absolutely. thanks for getting us. My brain is certainly the cogs are whirring, but I'm sure yours are too. So can I just open the, the floor to uh, questions for, for Rob? Anyone has? Inga. Um, when I was looking at Hepworth, one of the stories that she sort of tells us her kind of Michelangelo mm. moment is viewing this slideshow of Egyptian sculpture, which her headmistress showed to, to her in Wakefield. Mm. And I mean, I initially started thinking about this whole program in terms of that, in terms of supplementary technology, which kind of brought a wider world to a kind of mm. a more kind of quotidian environment um, in England. Um, and I was always, I never, I never found any sort of such details about more when mm. I was looking at the kind of early period. One thing I did find, which probably corroborates your view of uh, Tony Dawes, was that he was part of a, um, a sort of experiment to look at the use of film in education in the sort mm. of late 30s and actually sort of wrote up a kind of part of the government report on this. Yeah. Um, but I wondered whether you'd found any... Um, evidence or any sort of information about that, you know, slides or film or anything being used at that time? No, that's not something that I've come across and I can think of immediately. Um, but I do think it's interesting to follow on that line of thought that um, Moore involves himself during wartime with arts inquiries that are beginning to work out the place of art in society, which are some of the first sort of governmental schemes or quasi-governmental schemes to think about the role of film uh, and the role of um, different sorts of education, how that can be used publicly, how that can be used in museums. And then is also one of the first, I think, think certainly the first contemporary artist to be shown in a programme on BBC television, mm -hmm. writes for the listener throughout the 30s, appears in numerous programmes. So that interest in thinking about how to present your works using new technologies is certainly central to his development later on. Mm -hmm. But I'll, I'll look further at what might be there early on to see if there's anything further to find there. I mean, that connects to a word that you use, uh, democratisation as well. And I think the cheap, uh, the circulation of cheap illustrated magazines um, and periodicals mm -hmm. obviously forming this kind of visual culture, mm -hmm. which I think, again, we take for granted, especially in Absolutely. our digital age. Yeah. But like you're saying, the use of film and images entering classrooms in a way through... You know, very good quality prints, though, even though they're widely circulated. Mm. And I think that idea of the democratisation of education, but also access to Absolutely. knowledge, yeah. is perhaps something I think you're you're trying to pursue. Absolutely, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's another parable, so it might be sort of turning away from some of my point. But another of my favourite stories about more from the sort of early point in London is uh, he sort of proudly said that he didn't need to buy books from Zwemers because he went so often that he knew everything off by heart. <laughs> like a library. Yeah. <laughs> observation that uh, you know it seems clear that with 25% of these secondary places having to be given as mm. uh, a scholarship based um, that there seems to be 
sort of um, inherent idea that this is important in terms of work, in terms of industry, mm -hmm. but but it's not sort of monetized the way it then yeah. subsequently becomes in terms of how you know the development of a creative class mm. during another kind of industry. So when do you think that conversion occurs, and is this perhaps a precursor? Do you incur what, to to a full education, do you mean? Well, no, to this notion maybe later in the century and certainly in, in Moore's lifetime that, um, you know, you can, you can not only make money as an artist mm. in this particular circumstance, heaven knows, but um, that, that there's the development of a creative class through perhaps all of these uh, steps along the way mm. know, quite early, it seems, in the 20th century. And uh, that, that there is a conversion that it's not just putting people in school to do work so that they have work to do, mm. but that there's there's a much larger uh, commercial element yeah. that's available and not just sort of, that, that there's a creative process here that adds value and creates something perhaps unforeseen. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to think of a, of a useful response to that that sort of situates it. I see there is a turning point. Um, it certainly doesn't feel to me, that until sort of the 1930s, education is rolled out in such a way that there's a full appreciation of the benefits of a full education. And this is pushed for from certainly sort of the left-wing sort of aspect elements of those pushing educational reform. But the, the question of the monetary um, investment in education isn't something I've come across. I'll look for. I think that's a useful avenue to think about further. Thank you. I think it's a good moment to um, pause, but we'll gather again as a panel to mm -hmm. kind of uh, connect some of these ideas. So thank you very much, uh, Rob. And uh, I'm going to hand over to our next speaker, uh, Rachel Smith. So thank you.